Hallelujah. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It's going to be a good program today. It's already been exceptionally good to me. I just, it's already been exceptionally good, period. This has been a good broadcast already because God has showed up and written music. He's written sounds. He spoke his word, everything. So this is, a, this is an awesome time, and it's an awesome time to be here together. Let's pray. Father, I ask you now, Lord God, I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, that we can learn your word together as a family. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to talk to you about something today that the Lord placed on my heart. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let's put up verse 1 right quick. I want to see that. Amen. Now, 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, verse 1, listen to this. Said, this know that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, <clears throat> this word, perilous, I want us to look at that a moment. Perilous in the idea of reducing the strength of something. Perilous means it's in the idea of reducing the strength. So in the last times, last days, a perilous times, it will start to reduce the strength. It means difficult, dangerous, by implication, furious, fierce, perilous. Now, I want you to listen to this one. It means to lower down into a void. To lower down into a void, to let down, to strike. It means a gape. The void is talking about it means a gape, a yawn, a chasm, or a vacancy. An impassable uh, interval, a gulf. Notice this is in the last days. The enemy will seek to reduce the strength of men. It will be a dangerous time, a fierce time, and he will strike. He will create a chasm and a gulf. A chasm or a vacancy. He'll seek to lower men down into a void or let them down into a chasm, <clears throat> a vacancy, an impassable interval or a gulf. The enemy's seeking to create the same void that he did in Genesis when it said, and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the earth had become without form and void because we know in the book of Isaiah uh, chapter 45 that he didn't create it formless and void he created it to be inhabited but there was this great void fixed this gulf in Genesis 1 2 a void a gulf it's the it's the gulf this gulf is mentioned in Luke 16 and verse 26 now, I want to get into something that's kind of heavy today. And, um, you know, I like to get into heavy things and, and learn new things. <clears throat> of course, that don't violate our fundamentals. But Jesus talked about this gulf in Luke 26 between heaven and hell. This is a place the enemy seeks to lower people down into. Now, you know, we hear people talk about hell we hear them teach about different things, and there is a heaven to gain, and there is a burning hell to shun. And if you don't know Jesus, then your destination is hell. So it would be a great, wise, wonderful thing to accept him as Lord and Savior right now. Now, it is a place, this is the place, but no one talks much about the void, the gulf. They talk about, I've heard teaching on the rich man, Lazarus, but not the gulf between them, the void. Now, the Lord began to talk to me about this. It is a place that is fixed between heaven and hell. It is a place that he lowers you into. How? This is a dangerous place to be. It is fierce and perilous. How do you know 
when you're being lowered into this void. Well, 2 Timothy goes on to tell us this. Now, let me get over here with you so we can look at that, 2 Timothy 3. Now, in this, it goes on to say in verse 2 that men shall become lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. I want you to think about some of these things. It starts talking about what's in the void. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means uh, uh, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, heady, that means reckless, High-minded, it means full of self-conceit. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Now, it is these things that the enemy uses to lower you into the void. They exist in the void. They make the void. They are the things that lower a generation or a world of people into the void. It creates it, and it lowers them into it. It creates a chasm, a gulf. And once you're lowered into it, those in hell cannot pass through it to get to those in heaven and those in heaven cannot pass through it to get to those in hell. And those in hell can't pass through it to get back to the earth. Now, stay with me on it. It is the gulf where people are trapped. And they are, and then we see this void in Genesis 1-2. After the war of Lucifer, he created this gulf, this void. Now you know how he did it. When, when he lured the angels, the race, uh, the fallen angels, when he lured them into unnatural affection, darkness was upon the face of the abyss. Hallelujah. Now, let's get into this in some, some detail here. The chasm, the angels that fell, the earth, darkness was upon this chasm. So you cannot see it. And see, this is the thing. You cannot see the chasm until you fall into it. And you're lowered into it by degree. It's not just a big jump. You begin to be lowered into it by those things we named that the Word told. And it says darkness was upon it, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness, darkness, night, obscurity. In Ecclesiastes 2.13, we see that light excelleth darkness, speaking of this darkness that covers this gulf and and hides it. The scripture declares in Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light, and it giveth understanding unto the people. Now, I want to look over at Luke chapter 16, and we're going to start really getting into this for a few moments. Luke 16, and this is the story of the rich man and Lazarus that Jesus told. Now, let's just see what he said here. Now, let's look at verse, oh, we'll look at verse 19. 
And there was a certain rich man. Now, you know it's not a parable. It was certain there was this guy. Now, this is really, this is really eye-opening, so really watch. They're certain that there was this rich man. Jesus is talking about it. And some commentaries and some even teach that they knew the one he was talking about, that they all knew him. And there's even some skepticism. I, well, I say skepticism, not really that, but there is some that, that uh, debate, I should say, whether this beggar was an illegitimate son of this rich man and why he wouldn't go out and have anything to do with him. And he just neglected him till he died. And the young man would beg for food, scraps that would fall from the rich man's table. And they say it probably was because he didn't have send people out to have him thrown out of his gate. He laid at his gate constantly. So this gives you an idea of what this certain man was like. He said he was clothed in fine purple, uh, in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That wasn't the dog's name, moreover, you know, but <laughs> you know, one young, uh, it was one, one real young person thought that was his name, you know, it said moreover the dog. So but it said, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and you're tormented. Now notice that. Abraham starts talking about this. And, he st and it says that he lift up his eyes, this rich man did, he lift up his eyes in hell. Now, he didn't go to sleep and wake up in hell. He just changed scenes. You know, men die with their eyes open, and they just change scenery. They never stop looking. They're either going to change scenes in heaven, and it just appears there, or in hell, it appears there. And so here this man lift up his eyes in hell, now, listen to what he says to him. He's already told him. He looked up over into paradise across this gulf. And he says, he saw Lazarus. And he said, send Lazarus down here. He saw this body of water in Abraham's paradise. This is the place that Abraham was given the day Melchizedek uh, approached him with the bread and the wine, and he came to him, and he said this to Abraham in Genesis uh, chapter 14, I believe it is. He comes to him, and he says this. He says, A blessed be Abram, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God. So he's talking about he gave Abraham that day, he gave Abram the blessing, I gave him a piece of heaven and a piece of the earth. And the piece of heaven is known as Abraham's bosom or paradise. That's where Jesus told the, the thief he would see him. And so it's there that the rich man is looking up into. Abraham was given Israel and he was given paradise in heaven for people to go there by covenant grace before Jesus came and died. So they could go there in covenant grace if they kept covenant. So now here, here is the thing. So the rich man is looking up there and he sees this body of water, this levee of water that's there. And he said, Father Abraham. Now it's amazing that he knew Abraham. And he looked at him and he said, have Lazarus. Take his finger and dip it in that water and come and touch my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Now, when he says this to him, 
you can notice the rich man's attitude hasn't changed. I wouldn't expect you to come, but send that beggar down here. Well, watch this. But Abraham said in verse 25, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and thou art tormented. Now this is amazing to me because he said to him, remember. So the rich man could remember, but also Abraham, look at the vast knowledge the man had. He said, remember in your lifetime. In other words, access to his paradise, he knows the seed sown for you to have gotten there. And he knows about your whole life, Father Abraham. Because he's the one that grants that he's the one that is guardian over the paradise. This was given to him in covenant. So he knew. He knew the life the man had lived. He knew everything about him. That's amazing to me. Now watch what he says here. He says, you have now, now listen what he's talking about. Remember in your lifetime, you received good things. He received evil things. Seed, time, and harvest. It's your seeds that put you there, and it's his seeds that put him here. So watch what he said now. He said, and beside all this, he said, now he's comforted, you're tormented, and beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. There is a chasm. There's a void. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. He said, Send him back that he could testify to my brothers. So they don't come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Notice the word. Notice the word, they have to hear. Hear to keep out of this gulf. They have to hear. It takes light to light up the obscurity of this cavern, of this chasm. Now I want you to listen to this. Abraham tells him these words. He said, you can't come through that gulf. I can't send anybody back. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Now listen close. Abraham died before Moses and the prophets. He never knew them. He never knew them. But somehow he knows them. He knew Moses and he knows the prophets. He knows the rich man. He knows Lazarus. The scripture says the day will come when you'll be known as you're known. He looked right at the man, and the man said, I want access to that paradise. I just want a drop of water from the paradise. He said, you can't because your seed puts you where you are, and Lazarus' seed put him where he is. And, and then he answers a theological question that absolutely is so big, I don't even know if a, a Bible college teaches it. He said, there's also this great gulf. There's this great gulf. What's it got in it? What is this great gulf, the reason you can't pass from here to us and we can't come to where you are? What is this gulf? He said it's full of covetousness. 
It's full, they're lovers of them own selves. It's full of covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, with uh, truce breakers, false accusers, uh, uh, full of self-control. Uh, uh, they don't have any self-control. They're fierce. They're despisers of those that, that are good. They're heady. They're reckless. They're full of self-conceit. They love pleasures more than God. They have a form of godliness, but to, they deny the power thereof. And there's no way that can enter into my paradise. It can't be passed through to get here. It keeps you in hell, and we can't come to rescue you because nothing that makes a lie and is evil can get into heaven. So nobody in heaven can go through covetousness, boasting, proud, high-minded, headiness, without natural affection. Nobody from here can pass through all of those things to get to you, to even rescue you. Now look at what he told. Listen to the wisdom coming out of his mouth. Abraham knew something that seminaries everywhere don't know. He said, this is a gulf. It's a chasm. It's full of this trash. And you can't get through it to get to us. And nobody from here can have anything to do with it anymore. So you're trapped there. And he said, well, send him back then. Obvious, the rich man knew no gulf. Nobody could get through it now. That was more torment. He knew he couldn't do that, and he knew what kept him there. Is this making sense? Is anybody getting hold of this? He knew what was keeping him there, and both sides knew. So he said, since this is the way it is theological, since this is the way it works, send Lazarus back to my brothers at my father's house. He said, no, he can't, he can't do that. Why? He said, because they have Moses and the prophets. They must follow the covenant. They must go through the word to get here. Nay, Father, but if somebody rose from the dead and went to them from the dead, they'd believe. He said, no, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't believe. They wouldn't believe. So he said they have Moses and the prophets. And Abraham couldn't have known Moses and the prophets in the natural. But notice he knows them. The rich man understands why he's in hell. Now he understands why nobody can get to him from heaven. And now he understands why he can't go there and go to heaven. It was going to take someone who would become all of those things that never committed one of those things to become our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, put that up on the screen. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became all of these things, though he never did one of them, never committed a sin. But he became these things. And he told the thief, you're going to be with me in paradise. Today you'll be there. The thief was dropped off in paradise. But Jesus, having bore all of this, went straight to that place. He went straight to that place of torment for three days and nights. But after that, when God called to him to raise him from the dead, he starts getting up with great power. And when he does, hell is, on a, uh, hell is in a tizzy. Hell is having a, a fit because they said, that's sin. Can't you see that sin? There's a gulf. He can't, he can't do this. He can't go there. Yes, it is sin. But it's not his sin. So there's nothing in that gulf to stop him from coming up into paradise because he has none of that in his life. So Abraham revealed what was in the gulf. 
And nowadays you see people and they don't think anything about it. And they'll let people in the pulpits. They'll let them in there. And they'll stand up behind the pulpits. And they're lovers of their own selves. They're covetous. They're boasters. They're proud. They're blasphemers. They're disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. You see them ordain LGBTQ people to stand in the podium and preach truce breakers, false accusers, to stand up and accuse without self-control, fierce despisers of those that are good. They're reckless and they're full of self-conceit. They love pleasure more than they're lovers of God. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He said, from such turn away. It is these things that the enemy uses to lower you into the void. They exist in the void. They make the void, as we talked about. It is these things. Abraham said to the rich man, Son, remember, in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil. But now he's comforting your tormented seed time and harvest. He's now reaping what he sowed. God made a way for everyone to be in the kingdom. A way to go to paradise and await Jesus rising from the dead if they would listen to Moses and the prophets. This was before the Lord rose from the dead. He made a way for everyone to be there. They had covenant grace. He went on to say, and beside all this, seed time and harvest and all of that, there is a great gulf fixed. And so that which would pass from hence to you, neither can they pass from us uh, uh, from thence, then he said, send him, of course, to his brethren and so forth. Now, let me finish this. So then you, now you know what the gulf is. You know what it was created. You know how it was created. And also when you get over into Revelation 21, and it talks about, I saw no temple in heaven, for there the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Uh, this is in Revelation 21. And then you see in verse 23, uh, chapter 21, verse 23, and the city had no need of the sun, <clears throat> neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Oh, this would raise a big debate right here. Verse 24, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The kings of the earth will bring their praise, his glory and honor, his valuables. I'll just leave that alone for today. They will bring their praise and worship their valuables and into it. And they will bring it to him, and it will be in the city, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Verse 26, and they shall bring the glory, the praise, and the honor, the valuables of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, detestation, idolatry, or maketh the lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. These things cannot enter into paradise nor heaven, but those in heaven are 100% pure and cannot go into these abominable things. So the, cav the chasm that keeps the wicked out of heaven is the same chasm or gulf that keeps the righteous out of hell. The chasm or gulf is filled with what is listed in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This gulf is filled with this, and the righteous cannot go through it, and the wicked cannot get to heaven through it because it can't, they cannot enter there, none of these things. All of these things are trying to sneak into your homes. Now, this verse goes on. Listen to what it says. 
It goes on to say, verse 6, 2 Timothy 3, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Then he goes on to com to compare it to Janus and Jambres in front of Moses. So he said, they, these things look to sneak into your homes. And each one will uh, sink you by degree into this gulf from which there is no crossing again after you're there. If you don't stop it and you don't receive Jesus, you sink by degree into these things. Now, listen to what I'm saying. The rich man was full of these things. And so when he lift up his eyes, he was in a place he couldn't cross again because that's what he died with. He died that way. Jesus became the only bridge to keep you out of there. He's the only one that could ever bridge it. And so now you have to make him the Lord of your life. And if you do, he went there for you. But if you die with these things in your life like that, you lift up your eyes in hell and all you can see is that. That's where you are. That's what you are. And that has now become your home. And so after that, there is no escape. Just like the rich man, he couldn't leave. There's no escape at all. And the enemy comes into your homes and he tries to do that. And it talks about he leads silly women captive. He said it's like that. It's talking about it's not talking just about what you think. It's talking about, when it said that about women, it said those that are in sin and they're practicing these things and they keep living like this and he starts sinking their homes by degree and sinking the people into this gulf. And they become proud, blasphemers, covetous, boasters without natural affection. So we have to guard our homes. You have to guard your homes. You know, I remember someone was cleaning the church. It was a company that we had hired to come in and clean the sanctuary in the church because it's large and, and it's hard for just, you know, it has to be done constantly. And this cleaning crew would come in. And one of them, you know, they went to church and all this, and it was great. And then... But one of them's child was laying on the front chairs in the sanctuary playing a video game. And one of our praise people that was on the praise team walked by and heard the video game. And they were just dropping words out of that video game that was, I'm talking about terrible things. And they're just letting him lay there and play this constantly. What is happening? He's creeped in to their house, and they're laden with sin, and he's sinking them by degree into this chasm. People preach about heaven, they preach about hell, but I don't hear anybody talk about the gulf, the void between them, that it's full of this, and neither one can pass through it to get to either place. Now you have a science for why the rich man couldn't go. Now you have a science for why purgatory is not true. To just go to hell for a little while and then pray somebody out. No, you can't do that because once they lift their eyes up there, they are full of everything in the chasm and everything in the chasm can't go into heaven. And no one can come there with their prayers and get you out. So we see that and we see people that we, 
We, we've got to stop being like silly people that they enter into the homes and laden with sin and let our children watch anything and everything that comes on television or just hand them a, an iPhone that is absolutely a gateway to the world of sin and death and just let them just surf everything on it until they're watching pornography. They're cussing like, uh, you know, we used to say in the South, cussing like a sailor. Well, there's a lot of sailors born again again and they don't do that but but just cussing and raving and talking four-letter words they're using all kinds of language they're watching uh, all these ungodly shows horror movies they're filling their heads i remember and they start filling their heads with harry potter and they fill their heads until youth leaders took their youth groups to see twilight and all of these things and introducing them to the occult and the whole time you're sinking a whole generation into the abyss you're sinking them down into to the great gulf and if they die in that gulf in hell they will open their eyes they will change scenes and they cannot get back through it again and you are to blame you're to blame because you knew better I watched a youth leader one time put on a vampire's cape and teeth in his mouth to take his youth group to see twilight Really? Hell yeah, that's a wicked youth leader, ain't it? No, that is a dumb pastor that would have him over the youth. And when it really comes down to it, what about the parents that let them go? I remember one time I, I had written this booklet called The Covenant of Abstinence. And I had written this thing, and, and uh, it was a ceremony that parents could have with their children, vow, and they would vow to keep themselves pure until the day of their marriage and enter covenant with their husband or wife. And I remember one little girl that her mother, I don't think, lived with them, and it was just her dad raising them. And she was so excited. Just, to, just, they're just young kids now. They were so excited, and their parents were standing with them. And the young girl said, now, Dad, and they had to give them a ring and all, and then the only person that could replace the ring one day would be the husband with his ring. And the young girl looked at the dad and said, I, now, you're going to do this with me too, right? You're going to keep yourself too, right? And right there, he told that girl. He said, now, that's just not fair. It, didn't, it wasn't for him, it was for her. In other words, he wasn't going to do it. I remember her telling us that. Said, he said, no, it's just not going to be that. I, I can't do that, and that's not fair to ask me as an adult. I guess he meant, I don't know. Well, he's just sinking his family into the abyss, laden with sin, laden with it. And you teach them to live as lovers of their own selves. They're the only thing that matters. And as long as they get their way, everything's, everything's cool. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Think about it. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. To look at a child and tell them when they're born with the plumbing of a man or a boy, a male, and tell them, well, you know, you might have the plumbing of a male, but it's yet to see what you are. Do you really think you're a girl? Oh, you, you're a damned idiot. You know that. I mean, not just an idiot, but I mean that. I told Rob the other day, I said, I use words now in the literal sense. Did you know that? I, do you know what, even if I say something like that, I'm thinking literally? I don't even think of insults. Not really, I'm thinking of, that's a damnable doctrine right there. That's teaching that could be, that could put somebody in a damned place. Because you're confusing them, and all that's happening is, is the enemy has crept into your house, and he's just sinking them a little at a time. 
into that void, into that abyss. So we've got to get wiser than this. And he said, from such turn away. How are we going to fix it, Brother Robin? It's a complicated world. How are we going to fix it? He says right here, look at this. And uh, what is it? Um, he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Then he says this, this is in verse 5, from such turn away. So how do, you, how do you defend that? How do you fight against it? You turn away. Turn away from it. If that's what's on your TV, turn away from it. If that's what's in your house, turn away from it. If that's the life you're living, turn away from it. Turn away from it. From anything that is covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, men loving themselves more than God, they're lovers of their own selves, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, uh, incontinent, uh, without self-control, fierce despisers of those that are, are good, heady, or reckless, high-minded, or self-conceit, uh, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having just an appearance of godliness but no power. Turn away from that. Turn away. So I wanted to talk to you a few moments about that gulf and let you uh, know what the Lord has shown me about the gulf. And so you can see now what he was talking about. You can see now what was going on. Hallelujah. Robin, if you'll come to the keyboard, I'm going to, uh, I want to read a, a prophetic word the Lord gave me today. I hope you've enjoyed the 11th hour today. We've enjoyed being here with you, and I hope you got a lot out of it. If you do, put a thumbs up or something and let us know and uh, where you're listening from, too. I guess we already know that from the chat, but but it's so good to, to be with all of you, and, and I was praying over you last night, all of our partners, and I want to tell you something. The 11th hour partners are the most precious partners in the world to me. They are absolutely, you are, you are dear to me. I pray over you every day. Uh, you are never without prayer. And you're never, and it's good prayer. It's praying the right things. It's praying success in your life. It's praying for things in your life. And, and, and I just want you to know that. And, you know, it's going to get better and better. Hallelujah. It will for you. Because we're praying and we're believing. Amen. Now, this is what the Lord impressed me with. <clears throat> the courage to fight is not readily within people. In most cases, it must be stirred up with speeches of patriotism. Hearing about freedom wakes up something within people. It wakes up something that was put there when man was created. That men were not meant to be ruled by tyranny and lies. For make no mistake, a lie is the strength of all tyrants. They must tell a lie so convincing that masses of people will follow it. But because tyranny's power is based on a lie, it cannot stand. It cannot last. A lie is built, made, and created with the force of fear. Fear then must be elevated in the people to the point that they will not even challenge the lie. And this is basically how Hitler rolled across Eastern Europe and all that he did. Nazism was built on a lie. And fear was elevated to the point that people were afraid they would die if they should challenge it. In this modern tyranny that has taken hold of the U.S. leadership, trying to read my writing here.
this tyranny that has taken hold of the U.S. leadership, the Democrat Party, and its Republican operatives have worked hard to establish this lie. Twist the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to support their lie. It is so well developed that fake wars and fake sickness can be perpetrated to the point that people react as if it is all true. One thing about a lie is that it has, it has to have a world, a whole world created in order to support it. But once built, the world of lies cannot be lived in to any reasonable degree. Satan is a liar and the father of it. He constantly looks for a bride, a wife, that he can father lies with. Now with the technology of deep fake and the like, if possible, the very elect can be fooled. And the jackal appears on a lying video with a Hitler-type background and threatens the American people if they don't believe and accept his lies. Hitler was afraid of the Jews, and the jackal party is afraid of the Christians. Why are they afraid of the Christians? Because Christians are not afraid of death. Therefore, they cannot be controlled. Obviously, there is more than one Biden, whether it be deep fake or a real person or both. Obviously, the facts of the Ukraine just don't add up, the Ukrainian war. Obviously, January 6th, for the most part, was a farce. Obviously, COVID was a created plan. Obviously, lies are being told that just don't add up. Obviously, the jab is now creating a panic across the world that it might be killing people. Obviously, the election of 2020 was stolen. Obviously, these are obvious to any honest, truth-seeking person. Now, if it is this obvious, why isn't it changing? Because of fear and a false sense of love. It is not wrong to speak out against tyranny. If the truth of 2020 is exposed, Donald Trump would walk back into office today. This is why it's buried. Where is the church in all of this? A large part of it has become silent or altogether passive, too passive. Have we, here we have arrived in the face of tyranny and the public waits to see what the church will do. Revival is breaking out like a wildfire. It should be allowed to burn. The fire will be allowed, uh, the fire will uh, be, if it's allowed to burn, will turn the consciousness of people all around the world. Just like it turned the conscious thoughts of Moses at the burning bush revival. During the pandemic, curfews were put in place. That here in Birmingham, you couldn't be out on the street after a certain time. No one really spoke against it. Why? Because the church believed the lie. And fear drove there in action. A movie called The Scarlet and the Black should be watched by the church and all America. It will help put things into perspective for you. If the revival that has broken out now is squelched, it will be because it is politicized and so-called experts will determine what it should look like. Revivals such as in the days of Evan Roberts, Azusa Street, Hebrides Revival, and on and on it goes. The great awakening, the most great awakening we've ever seen in this country was the Jesus Revolution of 1968 through 72. These revivals were wildfire, burning, led by the Holy Spirit, Men is who wants to organize them. The prophetic revival came before this one broke out. And immediately men tried to control it. Stop the prophets, what they're saying. 
make them sign petitions to say, to run all their prophecies through us. Men seeks to control it. What would you have done? What do you think would have happened if Moses had have taken the water that the Lord said pour on the ground and it turned to blood in front of the bush and said, my God, the bush is burning. I better douse the flame. That was a burning revival controlled by the Lord himself and it didn't hurt one leaf on the bush. But it changed Moses' mind forever. Men's organization of these things kill it stone dead. Every time, let the fire burn like Moses did. It didn't harm the bush, but taught Moses about miracles and brought the freedom of a whole nation. So this is where we've arrived. And the people are waiting to see what the church will do. Haven't we had enough lies? Haven't we seen the bride of Satan rise too much to conceive and give birth to his lying? To give birth to his lying sons and daughters. What are they? Fake wars? Fake sicknesses? Things I've put on the people to kill them, to control them, fake inflations, fake shortages. These are sired by Satan, and they're his sons and daughters across the world. So haven't we seen enough of this? Haven't we seen enough? I think so. So we, this revival has come to change the minds of everything. You saw it break out. You saw it break out in Asbury. Well, they don't even know if that's real. You're the problem. You're the very problem. What other motive could they possibly have to pack in a place and, and line up miles down the road just to get in and experience the presence of God? What other motive do they have? They're not liars like you. They came in to worship. You say it's not real. So you, you see it break out, hooking up like train cars all over the world, revival. Man, we don't know if this is true revival. Well, are you going to make them sign a piece of paper that will run all their revivals through you? So that your idea of revival, what if Moses had have had a committee on, the, on Mount Sinai? The bush blazes up. Moses said, I'll turn aside and see this great sight. Well, you might look at it, Moses, but before you talk about it, you better run that through the elders. We want to know. We're going to tell you if that's real or not. He never asked anybody. But he delivered a nation. And if you want to know what holds this nation and any nation in bondage right now, it's all the sons and daughters of Satan that he sired lies with. It's his sons. Those lies are his sons. That's what's holding it captive. And when you see people stand up and, and spew these lies, well, it's all coming out now. And it'll keep coming out. And when it does, it's going to get so ridiculous that people will either start resigning or they may run them out of town on a rail. But it's about to change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I ask you today to let the, the truths on this program sink deep into the hearts of the people. That it take root in their lives and grow up and become greater than any problem they ever face. And I give you praise and honor and glory. And I ask you, Lord, to put a hedge of protection around all of our partners. All of the partners all over the world, Lord, wherever they are at right now. It makes no difference what, what country, what province, what state, Lord, wherever they are. 
I plead the blood of Jesus over them that you would surround them and their children and their grandchildren with this great hedge of protection and let the truth like a lion roar out for them, Lord God, and protect them in every way. I ask you to send them supernatural provision into their homes. Supernaturally, Lord, fill their gas tanks up. Supernaturally, Lord God, get their rent paid and their house payments paid and their light bills. Supernaturally, fill their cupboards, Lord God, with, with food and sustenance to feed their families. And not just survival food, Lord, but food that is pleasing, food that they will enjoy and they will bring joy into their home as they sit around their table and enjoy the provision of the Most High. I ask you, Lord, to save our partners' sons and daughters. Lord God, I pray over our partners today on the 11th hour. And I go before the court of heaven with my petition. I pray, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, that, Lord, surely you've bore their sickness and carried their pain. Lord, and with your stripes they're healed. 1 Peter 2, 24, Who your own self bear their sin in your own body on the tree, that they being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, and with your stripes they're healed. Lord God, I thank you for our partners. Lord, I thank you for every prayer that's ever been prayed by us for our part, by our partners, Lord. Lord God, I pray and I release my faith for them in every area of their lives. Lord God, I pray that the power and the anointing that's on Robin and me and the power and the, the corporate power and the anointing that's on YFMCI and Lord God, Church International and the whole 11th hour program, Lord God, and all the anointing that is present, Lord, I pray it rests on them also in the lives, in their, in their lives, in their homes, in their ministry. Let it be upon them, Lord, as they minister and on them as they pray. Let it be on their children to remove burdens and destroy all yokes. I pray, Lord God, enter their names into Psalm 23, that, Lord God, you are their shepherd they shall not want. You make them to lie down by the prospering green fields. You lead them beside the still waters. You, Lord, restore their soul. Lord God, though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they'll fear no evil, for you're with them. And you'll bring them out. And you go with them everywhere they go. Enter their names into Psalm 91, Lord. That because they dwell in the secret place of the Most High, they shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say of you, Lord, you are their refuge, their fortress, their God, and in you will they trust. Surely you'll deliver them from the snare of the fowler and the noise of pestilence, and you'll cover them with your feathers, and under your wings shall they trust. Your truth shall be their shield and buckler. They'll not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at their side, ten thousand at their right hand, but it'll not come near them. Only with their eyes shall they behold and see the reward of the wicked, because they've made you, Lord, even the Most High, their refuge and their habitation. There shall no evil befall them, neither shall any plague come near their dwelling for you'll give your angels charge over them and they'll keep them in all their ways and they'll bear them up in their hands lest they dash their foot against a stone they'll tread upon the lion and adder the young lion and the dragon shall they trample under feet because they've set their love upon you Lord therefore you'll deliver them you'll set them on high because they've known your name they'll call upon you and you'll answer them you'll, you will be with them in trouble you will deliver them and honor them with long life will you satisfy our partners and show them your salvation. I pray Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 through 23 over them, Lord. I cease not to give thanks for them, making mention of them in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give unto them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, that they may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to them who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath given him all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, Lord. 
I pray Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, Lord, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that you would grant them according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with might by your spirit in their inner man, that Christ may dwell in their hearts by faith, that they, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. I pray these prayers over our partners. And Lord God, I pray over their children and their household. Raise them up to be shining lights in a beautiful city on a hill in these days. Lord, take the nuggets from what was said in this program in all the 11th hours and strengthen their soul and bless their soul. Bless their mind, their will, and their emotions and bring the hopeless hope Bring them hope, Lord, in these other nations. Hope in these provinces where there is none. And I give you praise and honor and glory. I thank you, Lord, for all those who support the 11th hour. For all those who support this outreach. Lord, and for all those who support Church International. I give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name. And, Lord, in the Robin D. Bullock outreach where we go out and just minister and preach, anyone who supports any of these, Lord, let it rest on them in a heavy way, the anointing that removes burdens and destroys yokes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. And so those of you, you know, tonight on the Church International YouTube channel, There'll be an international prayer stream. Go there tonight. If you're in any nation around the world watching, go there and let your request be known. Our prayer ministers will be there praying over you. And you can chat in. And that's tonight. And and you will be able to. Now, if you're watching this, this is a Tuesday. If you're watching it live, it's Tuesday. And that's tonight at 7 p.m. Central Time. Go there and let your request be known. Tonight at Church International, in the physical, there will be an awesome prayer meeting happen in the building there every Tuesday night at 7 Central Time. And I'm praying over our partners. I started on this program. I'll finish this evening praying for the day. But know you're always, you always have prayer. Hallelujah. Always. Praise God. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today, hasn't it? It's been a wonderful 11th hour. I want to thank all of our partners from around the world for watching today and staying with us today. I don't know if you're watching me on YouTube, on our website, or Facebook, but I want to thank you for tuning in to all of them. Amen, wherever you are today. Come on, Krista, and you can tell us how to prosper And you can receive the offering today if the people want to give. And you know people say this, you know, or maybe they wonder this. What do I give? How much do I give? Well, you just be obedient. Mm -hmm. You be obedient. And if you're just obedient, it's more than enough for you or us. I mean, (laughs) obedience is better than sacrifice. Hallelujah. 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 It's better to be obedient with 50 cents than it is just to sacrifice $50. Yeah, that's the truth. Hallelujah. So, um, and also be sure and pray with the people to receive Jesus. Amen. That's the number one thing right here, right now. Yes, Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to do that first <laughs> because that is the number one thing and number one priority.